By Bobby Troop, if you ever plan to motor west, travel my way, take the highway, that's the best. Get your kicks on Route 66. Have you ever wondered the origins of Route 66? Did you know that Route 66 is probably the most popular highway, not only in America, but in the world? There are Route 66 associations in Australia, Japan, Germany, the Czech Republic, Netherlands, Belgium, UK, Italy, Brazil, Norway, and Canada that all organize events and tours. Route 66 was the subject of geographic calendar three years in a row. In Illinois, Route 66 consistently rates as a top five destination. The first European Route 66 festival took place in Ofterdingen, Germany in 2016. There are companies that I work with in six countries that specialize in Route 66 tours. There's been Route 66 festivals in Europe, in Zlen, Czechia, 2018, an estimated 20,000 plus people attended from 10 countries. In a recent study, it was determined that the Route 66 shield is probably as recognized internationally as Coca-Cola. So how did an American highway become a destination? How did Route 66 replace the Statue of Liberty as a symbol of American freedom? How did the simple highway become a catalyst for a mid-century preservationist movement? How did an American highway inspire someone from the Netherlands to found an association and create models of Route 66 locations? First, the most amazing thing about Route 66 is it doesn't exist. On June 27, 1985, American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials decertified the road and voted to remove all highway signs. So how did a highway that doesn't exist become the most famous highway in America? It all began with the bicycle. The Wright brothers manufactured bicycles. Alex Albert Champion of Champion Spark Plugs he came to America to race for a bicycle manufacturer. Louis Chevrolet started with bicycles. More than 20 pioneering auto companies started with the manufacture of bicycles. By 1896, there were more than 400 bicycle manufacturers in the United States Dramatic jump from 1890 when there were just 24. Bicycle races and tours became a national phenomenon. And it was the League of American Wheelmen formed in 1880. They petitioned for better roads, for better understanding of bicycles, for bicycle touring. The organization had more than 100 Good roads. And at the same time that people were discovering the bicycle, the horseless carriage was coming into being. In 1896, a Duryea motor wagon was given top billing over the albino, the bearded lady, and the fat man. The first American automobile race took place November 28, 1895, and it started at Chicago's Jackson Park. It was a 54-mile race to Evanston, Illinois. First place was number five, driven by automotive pioneer J. Frank Duryea. The Duryea brothers were some of the first to manufacture automobiles for sale. Their average speed, 7.3 miles per hour. By 1901, there were more than 50 automobile companies in the United States manufacturing electric steam and gasoline automobiles. As an interesting little bit of a historic footnote, electric vehicles were one of the dominant uh, types of vehicles, especially in urban areas. 
Did you know that in uh, 1898, the first pedestrian killed by an automobile was a gentleman named Bliss. And I don't know how slow the poor man was, but he was struck and killed by an electric taxi cab in New York City. 1901, Alexander Wenton, pioneering automobile manufacturer, he attempted to drive coast to coast was an ill-fated trip. He only made it as far as the sands of Nevada. But in 1903, Dr. Horatio Jackson became the first person to drive from coast to coast by automobile. I have a feeling that uh, drinking was involved. No good story starts with, it began with a salad. And this adventure of Mr. Jackson's was done with a $50 bet. This is a recommendation of gear that you needed for travel. Uh, rope, shovel, axe, block and tackle, toolkit, oil skin, suit, tent, ground cloth, clothes for all weather, five gallons of water, food for four days, pistol, five gallons of oil, five gallons of gasoline, tires, tubes. And this was a 1904 recommendation for people, if they were planning to drive from Detroit to St. Louis, Missouri. One of the troubles we have, especially as we age, is adapting to changing times. Mr. Ezra Meeker, kind of a hero of mine, he managed to do a fantastic job of uh, adapting, if you will. Keep in mind this date. He was born in 1830. He followed the Oregon Trail West in 1851 with an ox cart. Then in the 1890s, he made four trips into the Yukon Territory during the gold rush. And much like today, he was lamenting the fact that we were so obsessed with the future, moving forward so fast, he was worried that we were going to forget the Oregon Trail. Today, we are afraid we're gonna, people are gonna forget Route 66. So he got himself an ox cart and he traveled the Oregon Trail on to Washington, DC. And, uh, speaking engagements promoting the uh, Oregon Trail. They got Congress to approve an Oregon Trail commemorative half dollar. 1910 to 1912, he made another promotional trip across the United States by ox cart. The National Automobile Company uh, sponsored a speaking tour by automobile in 1914. Working with his son, he built camp, helped build Camp Cajon, one of the first service station complex in the Cajon Pass and along the National Old Trails Road. This became Route 66 after 1926. And incredibly, in 1924, he flew to Dayton, Ohio, and met with Wilbur Wright. This gentleman's extremely fascinating. Anton Westgard, a Norwegian immigrant, true pioneer worthy of... Uh, Christopher Columbus or Magellan. He was appointed by the Federal Highway Administration Director Logan Page to research appropriate locations for the transcontinental, first transcontinental highways. In 1909 to 1914, mostly in the West and Southwest, he mapped over 50,000 miles of roads for automobile use. And uh, one year alone, I believe it was 1912, he covered more than 20 thousand miles. To put that into perspective, consider this. Edsel Ford, in the summer of 1915, traveled to California to the Panama Pacific Exposition uh, with some college buddies. And he was traveling over one of the, quote, better highways at that time, the National Old Trails Road. In 1915, his journal entry, July 15th, had lunch at Ash Fork, loafed along, found it very hot, bought gas and oranges at Sligman. Stutz broke another spring 15 miles from Sligman. Cadillac and Ford went on to Kingman, arrived at the Brunswick Hotel midnight, 156 miles. Imagine Westgard doing 20,000 miles. Emily Post was another one that popularized road trips. She traveled coast to coast in uh, 1915 and wrote a best-selling book by Motor to the Golden Gate about her adventures. And uh, fortunately, that book is now available. It's been reprinted, and you can purchase copies on Amazon.com. 
Uh, there were quite a few road associations during this period. National Old Trails Road, 1912 to 1926, uh, from uh, Maryland to California, knitted some of the nation's most historic highways. Uh, Santa Fe Trail, the uh, Beale Wagon Road, uh, the National Road, but there were others. We had the Lincoln Highway, we had the Dixie Highway, we had the Jefferson Highway. They all had a major shortcoming. But it was a time of rapid and dramatic transition. In 1909, there were 828,000 horse-drawn vehicles manufactured in the United States, but a mere 125,000 automobiles. 20 years later, 4,000 horse-drawn vehicles were manufactured and 4.75 million automobiles. It was an astounding time period. First traffic light in 1919. In 1920, three out of five families have an automobile, but only two in five have indoor plumbing. The main problem was still simply, there was no place to drive an automobile. Even with the advent of the US highway system in 1925 and 1926, it was a long time before we had all weather roads coast to coast. A little bit of a footnote, officially Route 66 is dated at November 11, 1926. That was when the agreement was arranged, was uh, made. Originally it was Highway 60, US 60, and it became 66 through a compromise. And early maps are very treasured today that show US 66 when it was US 60. But just because it was a U.S. highway, and just because there was dramatically changing times, didn't mean that a cross-country drive was not an adventure. Route 66 was not fully paved until 1936, the last section being paved near Hackberry, Arizona, Hackberry and Valentine, Arizona. But it was a marketing campaign. It actually started in 1913 with Judge Lowe who was the president of the National Old Trails Road Association. He started a marketing campaign and promoted the National uh, Old Trails Highway, the National Old Trails Road, as the main street of America. Well, Cyrus Avery and a band of visionaries in the spring of 1927 launched an organization that in, in essence was a chamber of commerce for the Route 66 corridor. The US Highway 66 Association started a branding campaign marketing Route 66. Route 66 was opportunity made manifest, especially during the years of the Great Depression. Anybody with an idea uh, could open a, a trading post. Uh, you could get a gas station, you could open a diner, and you could, you could do well. As an example of the traffic, even though a lot of the people were impoverished during the period, in 1939, the Arizona Highway Department, for the first time, caught, uh, recorded 1 million vehicles entering Arizona on Route 66. An interesting story about that uh, with Ed's camp, but we'll share in a future time. Here in the modern era, the era of Renaissance, it's easy to forget that Route 66 was not all neon and tail fins. It was a segregated highway. America was a very, very segregated nation. Prejudice was an accepted norm. Victor Green in the 1930s, he was a postman in Harlem, New York. He saw a need and he created the Negro Traveler's Green Book, the sort of uh, a AAA guidebook, if you will where services were available for the, quote, Negro traveler. Uh, the upper right, upper left corner of the abandoned looking building there, that is a very interesting historic site. That's the Thrat Station in Luther, Oklahoma. This was uh, a family of freed slaves came to the Indian territories in Oklahoma in uh, the late 19th century, started a farm and a quarry with establishment of the Ozark Trails Highway System, they uh, began offering garage mechanical services selling gasoline. And this carried over into the era of Route 66. 
And it was one of the few service stations in that area and garages that would offer service to African Americans. The bottom picture is the White Rock Court in Kingman, Arizona. This was built by Conrad Minka in the 1930s. And of all the motels in Kingman, Arizona, this was the only property that would offer service to African Americans. But Route 66 was its own worst enemy. It was an antiquated highway. Traffic needs, was, it was a tsunami of, of growth in traffic, especially after World War II. And yet most of the road was highly antiquated. The old road through Oatman and Gold Road set Greece past the uh, uh, sharpest curves, steepest grades anywhere on Route 66, was in use to 1952. Some of the bridges dated back to the teens. It was bloody. But still, Route 66 had a popularity. Not only did we have the U.S. Highway 66 Association marketing Route 66 as the main street of America, we had the Grapes of Wrath, the book and the movie. Route 66, the song by Bobby Troop that was made popular by Nat King Cole, came the most recorded song in history with almost every version and a rendition. Route 66, even into the modern, the last half of the 20th century, even as it was being eclipsed by the interstate highway, it still had a persona. It had a recognizable, it was a recognizable entity. Uh, Lucille Ball, Desi Arnaz, during their popular television program, they filmed a couple episodes where they drove from New York to California on Route 66. Uh, we had the television show, Route 66. In the early 1980s, a movie William Defoe and Judge, Judge Reinhold would probably wish that nobody would watch Roadhouse 66, most of which was filmed in the Kingman, Arizona area. I think most everyone can agree today, Route 66 is not our most historic or our most scenic highway, but it is the ultimate road trip it has become a grand adventure. It's a chain of breathing, living time capsules. It is America's longest small town. The uh, picture to the right, that is Grand Central Market in Los Angeles on 7th uh, downtown, um, an original alignment of Route 66, just a few blocks from the original Western Terminus at 7th and Broadway. If you get a chance, the Grand Central Market is just amazing. Uh, I don't know how it is during the COVID area. I imagine most everything is closed, but we're hoping for better times in 2021. Not only is this an overwhelming uh, sensory overload of sights and smells and taste, foods from all over the world, delicacies, fresh produce, bakeries. It's also a collection of vintage and modern neon signage. Grand Central Market has been open for over 100 years. Route 66 is also the quintessential American experience, and that is part of its international appeal. It's a blending of the past, present, and future. But increasingly, with the passing of time, the old double six is viewed with a reverence that separates it from historic context. It's easy to forget that on the main street of America, mayhem, murder, and disaster shared the stage with vacation families and colorful characters that transformed the trip into a memorable adventure. Route 66 is also very endangered. As an example, more than 95% of its bridges are currently scheduled for demolition or replacement and fewer than 5% of authentic Route 66 motels still serve their original purpose. If you'd like to, you know, hopefully when we get through on the other side of the, this, this mess, this apocalypse, America during COVID, RV sales and rentals have soared and people are rediscovering the great American road trip. And I can't think of a better highway to rediscover America, to rediscover the American love affair with a road trip than on the main street of America, iconic. 
So all I can say is let the adventure begin. Discover America. Stop by the Jackrabbit Trading Post, a time capsule from the 1940s, Uranus Fudge Factory and General Store, the quintessential 1950s roadside attraction in the 21st century, Gay Parita in Missouri. All along Route 66 are living time capsules like the Wagon Wheel Motel, Grand Canyon Caverns that opened in 1927. We've come full circle. Bicycling. Bicycling is now big on Route 66. Recently, the Adventure Cycling Association uh, produced a map set for people bicycling Route 66, a guide. And there are tour companies now that specialize in Route 66 tours by bicycle. Folks, what I had in mind this morning was to uh, trying a little bit of an experiment. Didn't know how this would, would like to go. Uh, didn't know how this was going to operate. And uh, so as a result, I thought we would just uh, not announce this, but we would simply give it a try and see if it worked. And uh, if we get this off the ground, then we will do regular monthly paid presentations on road trips in, in America, grand adventures, back road odysseys, and automotive history. And we'll start doing these on a regular monthly basis. This is a pay-per-view situation. And uh, I'd sure like to hear your input. I'd like to know what you think. And uh, hopefully you had uh, enjoyed this this morning. 